Questions, Question Zoral, the Honourable Member for Milton. the Prime Minister about the illegal border crossings in the country. As many already know, Mr. Speaker, this is a serious issue we have in the country. Over 25,000 people have crossed over since it's begun, and indeed 600 over this past weekend alone. There are strains within our own federal system, and now we're seeing strains on housing in local municipalities. Mr. Speaker, what I'd like to know from the Prime Minister is what is his plan to deal with the situation? Okay. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to a compassionate asylum system, all the while ensuring that only those who deserve to who should be in Canada are allowed to stay. In contrast, the Harper Conservatives cut $390 million from the CBSA and cut refugee health care. They created massive backlogs and processing delays, which we are still working to fix. We have invested $173 million, which include $74 million to ensure faster processing of claims. And while Conservatives continue to vote against funding for our security agencies, we will make sure they have the resources they need. Honourable Member for Milton. The problem, Mr. Speaker, is this, that the Liberal government has three different stories spinning at this right. point yeah. in time. Yeah. The first one is the one that was unleashed on Twitter, and it did not say that only those eligible to stay would stay. In fact, it was quite an open invitation. Yes, the second is. is the Minister of Immigration, who will not even say the word illegal border crossing, and instead is travelling around trying to convince other people not to come to this country. And the third, Mr. Speaker, is something that the Minister for International Development said, wherein she posted, she posed the possibility that it's a good thing this is happening because it's helping a job shortage in her area. Can the Prime Minister tell me which story is the story they're going to go with? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, the Conservatives' approach is to muddy the waters and play up divisions and fear. Uh, we've made very clear that we are an opening, welcoming country, but we are also a country of rules and laws. And anyone who arrives in this country, whether it be regular or irregular migration, gets the full process of our Canada's immigration system applied to them from security checks to analysis of their files. We are signatories to international conventions that makes us uh, welcome refugees, but we do need to ensure that they are actual refugees or they get sent home. The Honourable Member for Milton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The apparent in our, in, in inability of the Prime Minister to actually understand the topic in front of us is gravely concerning. Yep. He opened up the floodgates when he tweeted out. He has done nothing to stop the floodgates since it's happened. And now he wants to rely upon playing some kind of blame game for things that he brought on this country yep. to himself. Will they do something concrete to stop this flow of illegal migrants across the border this summer? Speaker, despite all the fear-mongering of Conservatives, I can reassure Canadians categorically that our immigration system continues to be applied rigorously and to the full extent of all the rules and principles that Canadians expect and indeed are reassured by. Yes, there is an increased flow of irregular migrants, but we are capable of dealing with them. We are capable of processing their files, and that, Mr. Speaker, is despite the backlogs left to us by 10 years of mismanagement of our system by the Conservatives. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, last Sunday on uh, Global, the Minister of Immigration said, we do not appreciate and we will not welcome irregular immigrants. Well, that was the beginning of something that might resemble the truth. However, a few days earlier, the Minister of Francophonie said that illegal immigration on Roxham Street was preferable to the alternative, the alternative being following the laws. Can the Prime Minister tell us who's right, the Minister of the Francophonie or the Minister of Immigration? The Right Honourable, the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, we see the Conservatives trying to fearmonger and sow division. Yes, we need immigrants into our country. There are labour shortages. We welcome people from throughout the world because we know that this leads to economic growth. It leads to better quality of life for all Canadians. But at the same time, we have an immigration system that has to be applied 
rigorously, and we do that with integrity. We have a process that that applies to everyone, whether they be regular or irregular, and we can assure Canadians that our system will continue to be assured. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, all Canadians know that under the Conservatives, immigrants followed the, the rules and they followed the laws. It's not the Conservatives who let people cross Roxham. It's not the Conservatives who let irregular immigrants in. And it's not the Conservatives that allow 7,200 illegal immigrants in. My question is simple. Does he regret his famous tweet, the Right Honourable, the Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, just to be clear for the member opposite, for a long time there have been irregular arrivals in our country, yes, even under the Conservative government, which makes it even more difficult to understand why they cut almost $400 million to our border services. Why did they cut in health care for refugees, for vulnerable people? Mr. Speaker, they created slowdowns in the immigration system that we are repairing, and we are applying our legislation. The Honourable Minister for Rimouska, Nejet Timiskwateli Basque. Mr. Speaker, in 2017, Kinder Morgan Canada declared $64.2 million in net revenue, and so they should have paid $64 million in taxes, but that's not what happened. What happened is that that company, using all possible tax loopholes, didn't pay a single cent, zero. They paid nothing. Knowing that, can the Prime Minister explain why it would be in the in national interest to give a blank check to, for how much, $5 billion, $1 billion, to a company like Kinder Morgan? that finds a way and has an interest in not paying its fair share of taxes. The Right Honourable, the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, what the NDP does not understand is that it's not a question of choosing between the environment and the economy. We have to create jobs while we protect the environment. Every year, we lose $15 billion because we don't have another market for our oil resources, and that costs money for everyone. We have researched and approved this Trans Mountain project under an improved and strengthened process, and it is in the national interest to go ahead with it, and that's why the pipeline will be built. The Honourable Minister, for, uh, rather, Member for Rimouski, Temiskwata, Les Basques. Mr. Speaker, does it make sense that a company that makes so much profit pays no taxes? It goes even further than that. For three years now, that company has earned more than $340 million. Do you know how many taxes were paid? 1.1 million in three years. So I'll repeat my question. Why would it be in the national interest to give a blank check of how much? 500 million, a billion, five billion to a company like Kinder Morgan that finds a way and has an interest in not paying its taxes. The Right Honourable, the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we can see that the NDP is doing whatever it can to block this pipeline that will create jobs in Canada and that will allow us to export our resources to new markets to improve the price that we are currently getting and to show leadership on climate change by bringing about carbon pricing and pollution pricing throughout the country as well as defending our coastlines with an internationally known oceans protection plan. We have proven that the economy and the environment go together. The Honourable Member for Masquinongi. Paying its fair share of taxes. The result? Kinder Morgan Canada has only paid 0.004% of what they should have paid over the last three years. Wow. Mr. Speaker, that's over $180 million of tax avoidance. And now the Liberal government wants to use Canadians' money to subsidize Kinder Morgan Canada against any future losses. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, why is the Prime Minister willing to use taxpayer funds to help an oil company that refuses to pay its taxes here in Canada? Yeah. Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, every year, uh, Canadians lose about $15 billion because we don't have access to a new market for our oil resources. Getting this pipeline built will fix that 
uh, and will lead to better jobs and will also allow us to continue to achieve our carbon reduction targets by bringing in a national price on pollution. These are things that Canadians understand go together. We grow the economy, we protect the environment, we do them both together, and that's what makes a difference for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Berthier Masquilongier. Take all these risks on and then give this company all the profit. That's not fair and that's not balanced, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister promised to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. Uh -huh. What has he done? Nothing. Nothing. Instead of offering a big fat blank check to a company that refuses to pay taxes here in Canada. If you're a regular Canadian, Mr. Speaker, and you don't pay your taxes, you don't get a bailout from the federal government. So why are they giving one to Kinder Martin Canada? Here, here. Mr. Speaker, just to correct the record, we have committed and are on track to phase out inefficient fossil fuel, subs inefficient fossil fuel subsidies by the year 2025. To do this, we announced in our first budget the expiration of the tax write-offs on capital investments in LNG facilities. In Budget 2017, we announced the elimination of certain tax credits for exploration expenses in the oil and gas sector. We're developing our resources while protecting our environment, including safeguarding our oceans and combating climate change, our government understands that a clean environment and a strong economy must go hand in hand. Honourable Member for Banff Airdrie. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals continue to try to rig our democracy. They've tried to silence the opposition by changing the standing orders. They've tried to change the electoral system to one that would only favour them. And they've used Canadians' hard-earned tax dollars to campaign during by-elections, including over $60,000 in Lac saint jean and almost $70,000 in Markham Thornhill. And that's just the beginning of the shady spending, Mr. Speaker. It's clear the Liberals want to use tax dollars to campaign. So will they commit today to banning taxpayer-funded ministerial announcements and travel in the entire pre-election period? The Minister of Democratic Institutions. I wonder if the member opposite is referring to a former minister who wore a partisan shirt while announcing the universal child care benefit. But, Mr. Speaker, we have committed to ensuring that we have a pre-electoral period where we do have regulated spending. So, Mr. Speaker, I hope that my, the, op the member opposite, along with all members in this House, can get behind ensuring that we have a fair and level playing field when it comes to our democracy. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. The member for Banff Airdrie. What I'm actually referring to is the $300,000 that Liberals have spent in campaigning in by-elections to, to date. Whoa. Now, we all know the Prime Minister favours dictatorships, but I hate to inform him that here in Canada, we're in a democracy, <laughs> and he actually has to listen to Canadians. And they're speaking loud and clear, Mr. Speaker, by not donating to his Liberal Party. Yep. Yeah. So since he now can't at, use his cash for access scheme, what does he do? Well, he responds by using thousands of taxpayers' dollars to campaign in by-elections. So will the Prime Minister commit today to banning this practice by his government in all future elections? Speaker, Bill C-76 does a lot to ensure that we have integrity in our elections. In fact, Mr. Speaker, it returns the Commissioner of Elections Canada to Elections Canada, something the previous government took away. In fact, Mr. Speaker, it also enables the Commissioner of Elections Canada to lay charges, something the previous government took away, Mr. Speaker. And in addition, Mr. Speaker, it also gives the, the Commissioner of Elections Canada the power to compel, something that may have aided in his investigations of previous scandals. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Beaupré, uh, Ile d'Orléans, Charlevoix. Mr. Speaker, with its arrogance, the Liberal government is forcing Elections Canada reforms on Canadians before Parliament has even voted on it. This is unacceptable. The Prime Minister decided to just take a shortcut and skip the stage in the House where legislation is dem democratically voted on by all members and all parties who have that responsibility and they have that right because they were elected on behalf of Canadians. Will the Prime Minister ask Elections Canada to stop implementation of this bill and wait for Parliament to adopt its... The Honourable Minister of Democratic Institutions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I have already said in this House on many occasions, the Prime Minister did not tell Elections Canada to go ahead with this bill. But what has happened is that this government has consulted with Elections Canada, contrary to the previous government, so that it can draft 
proper legislation so that on and because on this side we are not afraid of Elections Canada. They've consulted with Elections Canada but they've forgotten to consult with Canadians who are the very people that are represented by the elected officials in this house who have been shut down and neglected to be given a voice on behalf of the people of Canada. question is this. For once, will the Prime Minister do the right thing? Will he give a voice to the Canadian people? Will he allow this House to debate in, in, in fair conscience? And more so, will he call off Elections Canada and tell them to put a halt on their changes until this House has had due process with this bill? Yeah. That is misrepresenting the facts, Mr. Speaker. The Elections Canada was consulted on this, and in fact, they said that they would, of course, be respecting the, the will of the House. However, Mr. Speaker, it is also this government that indeed believes in giving Canadians a right to vote, something and a voice in their vote during elections, something the previous government decided to take away when they got rid of vouching, Mr. Speaker, something the previous government decided to take away when they got rid of the voter identification card, Mr. Speaker. This government believes in Canadians voting, and guess what? We're not afraid of them voting either. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Carleton. Well, the Minister of Democratic Institutions should know that there is no such thing as a voter identification card. It's called a voter information card. There is a difference, and the Minister should know, but there is also great suspense, Mr. Speaker. The government, uh, we just learned, the deficit from last year was twice what the government promised in the last election. But I found a quote on the Liberal website today. Quote, the deficit will decline and our investment plan will return Canada to balanced budget in 2019. It's still on the site today. Will they end the suspense? Will they keep that promise, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister of Finance Order. I'm happy to say that the plan that we put in place in 2015 is still on track. What we've seen, we've seen, we've seen the lowest unemployment rates in 40 years. We've seen growth rates that are the fastest among G7 countries. So, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to make investments in Canadians to ensure that our economy does well, to ensure that Canadians do well, to ensure that Canadians have jobs today and tomorrow. Order. I expect members to understand that when they don't have the floor, their microphones are not on, and then people back home can't see, hear what they're saying, can't make, they hear the noise, but they don't know what their argument is. They want to hear the arguments from both sides. So I'd ask members to wait until they have the floor before speaking. The Honourable Member for Carleton now has the floor. Mr. Speaker, he says the Liberal budget plan is still on track. Well, but there are two tracks. There's the track that's on the Liberal Party website, which says the budget will be balanced in 2019. And then there's the track of the Finance Department that says it will be balanced in 2045. So the question is, if his plan is still on track, which track? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker. I think by now Canadians understand what we pay attention to. We pay attention to them. What we've done over the last few years is ensure that more Canadians are working. 600,000 new jobs, the lowest unemployment rates we've seen in 40 years. And we're able to do all that, Mr. Speaker, while having a lower level of debt to GDP than we saw during the entire time of the Harper government. Mr. Speaker, we will remain on our track, which is to invest in Canadians, to grow our economy, to create jobs, to create confidence for the future in our country. The Honourable Member for Essex. Last week, the White House announced it would start yet another investigation by the U.S. Department of Commerce, and this time our auto industry is in Trump's crosshairs, threatening massive 25 per cent tariffs. This type of threatening tactic is becoming all too familiar, with a Canadian exemption on aluminum and steel expiring this week. Three of our largest industries being slapped with unfair, baseless tariff threats. The minister has done nothing to defend our auto sector. Canadians who work in auto want to know what this minister's specific plan is to protect their jobs. Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, I want Canadian auto workers to know that our government stands firmly behind them and with them. As regards the Section 232 investigation mooted by the U.S. administration yesterday into cars, let me be extremely clear. The idea that Canada and Canadian cars could pose any kind of security threat to the United States is frankly absurd, and I have made that clear to the U.S. administration. Honourable member for Windsor West. The reality is that the Liberals and this Prime Minister have shown their defeatist attitude on manufacturing from the start. In fact, the largest Liberal investment in auto was a $525 million loan to Volkswagen for operations in the southern U.S. and Mexico. Wow. It's an absurd and reckless approach to Canadian taxpayers. What we don't need is a list of isolated one-off Hail Mary agreements. Since 2002, companies, suppliers, workers, all have asked for a specific national auto strategy. When is this government going to table what that specific means for Canadians, companies and workers and defend their jobs for a change? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Innovation. I'm glad that the member is very excited about this topic because he was at the announcements we made when we've invested over $5.6 billion in the automotive sector since we formed government. This has helped create thousands of jobs in our economy, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to focus on the automotive sector. This is absolutely critical to our economy. It represents close to half a million jobs, both part-time and full-time jobs. We have a plan. We're investing in the automotive sector, and we're seeing significant and historic investments in this sector, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Edmonton Riverbend. Mr. Speaker, we are now three days away from the deadline for Trans Mountain. In April, the Prime Minister promised the government is actively pursuing legislative options. On Friday, the Minister of Natural Resources said there's no guarantee that we can keep the project alive. On Sunday, the Justice Minister wouldn't, con wouldn't confirm when or if legislation is planned. Mr. Speaker, can someone, anyone from that side of the House, please tell us where is the legislation that Canadians were promised to save Trans Mountain? Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, uh, we have been saying in this House now for um, many, many months uh, that the pipeline is good for the country. The pipeline is good for the country not only for the many thousands of jobs that it creates, but getting a better price for our crude internationally, expanding our export markets because we have with $1.5 billion established a world-class ocean protection plan. And we understand that many, many Canadians and more Canadians all the time realize that the Trans Mountain expansion is good for Canada. Order. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford, uh, I'd ask him to come to order. I've heard a lot from him today, but he hasn't had the floor. Honourable Member for Halliburton, Portha Lakes, Brock. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government has had a year and a half to develop a plan for Trans Mountain. And now, three days short of the deadline, as the country turns to its Prime Minister, we see there is no plan. The Minister of Natural Resources admitted it. The Minister of Justice confirmed it. This national crisis never needed billions in taxpayers' money to solve. What it needed was a Prime Minister to lead. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. So, can the Prime Minister confirm for Canadians that there is no legislation coming forward to save the Trans Mountain Expansion? Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, uh, we, have, we have said for uh, a number of months now that uh, there are legislative options that the government will consider. The government has also said that courts have already said in no uncertain terms, including the Supreme Court of Canada, so when you move resources in this country from one province to the other, it is squarely within federal jurisdiction. This is a pipeline that has been approved by the Government of Canada and, by the way, by the Government of British Columbia, and it's good for Canada, and it's good for British Columbia too. Honourable Member for Lakeland. But, dis but despite the Minister's talk, the obstacles and roadblocks and challenges remain. And with only three days left until the deadline, the Natural Resources Minister said, incredibly, quote, there's no certainty with these things. But certainty is precisely what Kinder Morgan and all energy investors need, not tax dollars or pension-funded insurance. Stability and predictability is necessary for economic confidence. Weeks ago, the Prime Minister said the Liberals would introduce a law to reassert federal jurisdiction over the expansion. 
Where is the legislation the Prime Minister promised Canadians? Here, Minister of Natural Resources. We understand that there has been uh, quite a bit of uncertainty associated with the project, and that uncertainty comes from direct and indirect threats from the government of British Columbia who would use every tool in their toolbox to stop the project. Understandably, that means that those who are investing hundreds of millions of dollars and more in the project want more certainty than there was. That's precisely what the Prime Minister has asked the Minister of Finance to do. We're in the process of doing that right now. Honourable Member for Lakeland. But the Liberals have been using no tools in their toolbox to ensure the expansion go ahead in the past year and a half. This crisis is a result of their lack of action and their failure of leadership. This weekend, the Justice Minister even said they're still, quote, considering all options. But the time for consideration is over. Canada needs action. action. So with only three days left, the Liberals are still failing Canadians with no law and no plan. It's a disaster. The Prime Minister is damaging Canada's reputation and risking future energy development. They already killed four major energy projects worth $84 billion, and hundreds of thousands of Canadians lost their jobs. So again, where is the law they promised? Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. The Honourable Member wants to talk about a disaster. It was the Harper Conservative disaster. Not one kilometre of pipe built to new markets. An inability to consult with Indigenous peoples that led to failure in one court case after another and the worst economic performance since the Great Depression. Mr. Speaker, that is a disaster. The Honourable Member for Stina Bulkley Valley. Well, I guess that imitation is the best form of flattery as they're being sued by First Nations. When it comes to paying for oil spills, many Canadians want to know who picks up the cost to the environment and the economy. The City of Vancouver has been waiting three years for the federal government to show up and force the company to pay for the damage done there. So rather than blowing billions of taxpayer dollars subsidizing more pipelines and more risks, will the Liberals finally show up, force the company to pay, or is this actually the Liberal oil strategy to simply privatize the profits while socializing the risk? Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, our government believes in world-leading marine safety, and that is why we put in place the Oceans Protection Plan. As part of that, we believe that we should use a polluter-pay principle, and that is why we are using the Ship Source Oil Fund as the mechanism by which compensation is provided for oil cleanup. This is an important fund that is industry-funded so that we make sure the middle-class Canadians don't pay for this. Mr. Speaker, mobilization and resentment over the Kinder Morgan project are increasing. Even 5,000 kilometres away from British Columbia, people are angry. Yesterday in Montreal, thousands of individuals came out into the streets and answered the call of environmental groups, artists and Indigenous groups. They do not want their money, billions of dollars, to be given to an oil company. Since when is it this government's policy to give a blank check that will use our money to be given to a foreign company? The Honourable Member for Natural Resources. The member knows uh, these major energy projects are controversial. Uh, they're controversial among provinces. They're even controversial within political parties. There might even be members within the New Democratic Party, maybe even from Alberta, who think it's good for Canada. I don't know. We also know that there are 43 Indigenous communities, 33 of them in the province of British Columbia, who think it's a good idea because they believe that the future of our energy resources should be a shared prosperity and Indigenous peoples should be part of it. Honourable Member for Coquitlam Port, Coquitlam. Mr. Speaker, sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections, including HIV and hepatitis C, are largely preventable but remain a significant public health concern in Canada. From coast to coast to coast, there are community based organizations that work every day with vulnerable populations at risk, especially from intravenous drug use in the midst of the opioid crisis. Can the Minister of Health update the House on the government actions in this field? Here, here. Minister. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my friend and colleague from Coquitlam, Court Coquitlam for his important question and his tireless advocacy to help address the opioid crisis. The Harper Conservatives addressed the crisis by trying to eliminate harm reduction services and tried to use the Supreme Court to shutter Canada's first consumption site. However, our government knows that harm reduction can help address the opioid crisis, and through the Harm Reduction Fund, we're investing over $30 million to organizations aiming to reduce the risk from drug equipment sharing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lévy Lavinière. Mr. Speaker, when we see that there has been cronyism, breach of contract, and deception, all with a view to obtaining very lucrative fishing quotas for for the Liberal family's little buddies, we can see that there is the appearance of conflict of interest. Why won't the Minister of Fisheries make his mea culpa and reboot the process in a clear, just, equitable and transparent way? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Clear. The allegations made by the other side, no matter how often they make it, are categorically false, and we're happy to answer any questions that the Commissioner of Con uh, Conflict Commissioner, Commissioner of Ethics, might have. In the interim, we are absolutely proud of the fact of the process that ensured that, that the best project was selected, so the highest number of Atlantic Canadians could benefit, including First Nations from four Atlantic provinces and the province of Quebec. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, the Fisheries Minister attempts to excuse his interference in the bid process that gifted a clam harvesting quota worth hundreds of millions of dollars to a shell company because of after the fact of involvement of minority Indigenous partners. But the rigged process also happened to involve the brother of a sitting Liberal MP, a former Liberal MP, and a cousin of the minister's wife, who's a former federal fisheries official. Again, Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister remove this minister from this file and restart the process? Again, Mr. Speaker, these claims are completely unsubstantiated, and the fact is that the that there's a new participant in the surf clam fishery should be no surprise to this Conservative government. They conducted a very similar process well, three years ago to include a new entrant into the surf clam fishery. The only difference, Mr. Speaker, was that they forgot to include Indigenous people. We, of course, have not forgotten. In fact, we're focusing on the fact that the best proposal was selected, including that will advantage the most number of people from Atlantic Canada and Quebec. Here, here. Order. I have to ask the members for uh, Battle River Crowfoot and Cypress Hills grass Grasslands not to be yelling when someone else has the floor. The member for Central Okanagan's Milk Me Nicola. Mr. Speaker, despite our warnings about Ong Bong's murky ownership, the Liberals threw caution to the wind and rubber stamped the sale of BC's largest senior care home provider. Now, Ong Bong has been seized and is under control by Communist China, Mr. Speaker. The minister told us this deal was in the best interest of Canadian seniors. Now, I'm hearing from constituents that say that the level of service at a local home has significantly deteriorated. Lives could be at risk, Mr. Speaker. The Liberals approved this deal. Now, what are they going to do to fix this mess? Right up. Right the Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows full well that under the Investment Canada Act, we have a very robust and rigorous process that examines all these issues. With respect to the issues regarding the health care services, the provincial government is responsible for that, and this is part of the arrangement in the compliance agreement, Mr. Speaker. If there are any issues, the member opposite should raise that with the provincial government, and if there's any breaches, the member opposite should raise that with the provincial government. And we will make sure that we will always advance Canada's national interest. Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this minister guaranteed that all was fine with the Chinese takeover of Bon Bon Insurance yeah, with our senior care facilities, but let me share one of the most recent inspection reports from a facility. Non-compliant in restate and fall, pre fall prevention plans. Non-compliant in having certified staff available to deal with critical emergency situations. Non-compliant with sanitation procedures. Do the Liberals still guarantee that Communist China is the best caretaker for our seniors? The Minister of Innovation. I can assure the member opposite 
that under the Investment Can Act, we followed the process, that we made sure we did our due diligence, we did our homework. We also worked with and coordinated with the provincial government to look at any of the regulations and concerns raised by the member opposite with respect to the Minister of Health in British Columbia. The member opposite knows full well that we have never compromised when it comes to national security, we've never compromised when it comes to our national interest, and we will always make sure that the benefits are received by Canadians, Mr. Speaker. Deputy Sherbrooke. Honourable Member for Sherbrooke, Mr. Speaker, effective protection of privacy is essential with emerging financial technologies, but the government is acting in a way like it's flying blind with its innovation agenda. The Privacy Commissioner sounded the alarm saying privacy has not been taken sufficiently into account. Yet again, the Minister of Finance is too busy with his friends, the banks, who can benefit from this personal information. Why has the minister not consulted with the commissioner nor consumers who will be directly affected? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know it's very important to have innovation in the banking sector, and this is why in Budget 2018 we had the opportunity for the banking sector to buy uh, certain companies, but it's clear we have to make sure that confidential information remains confidential, that ha has been the ca case, is the case, and will continue to be the case. Mr. Speaker, banks have enormous trove of all our personal information. Every liquor store purchase, alimony payment, failed mortgage. No wonder the hackers are always trying to crack this data safe because it's a literal gold mine. And legislators around the world are working to protect the data privacy rights of citizens. But this minister, he's put a for sale sign on it to allow the banks to sell our personal information to third party operators. So why is he gonna when is he gonna stop acting like a butler on call for the banking elites and start standing up for Canadian citizens for a change? Yeah. Well, minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite is absolutely wrong. What we're doing here is we are working to ensure that our banking sector stays innovative. We're recognizing that we need to be able to have financial technology that works. What we are also ensuring that confidential information remains absolutely confidential. There is no change to those regulations. We will continue to assure that that's the case while we also pursue an innovative Canada. The Honourable Member for Beauport-Limoilou, Mr. Speaker. My conversations with people in Beauport or Limoilou have been very helpful. You know, the public are rarely mistaken. Over the weekend, I met with hundreds of people who approached me and wanted to talk about the unjustified spending of Madame Jean. Just like the official opposition, my fellow citizens feel that Madame Jean ha has not given acceptable explanations. When will she give acceptable explanations? The Honourable Minister, I think we should be very proud to have a Canadian at, at the head of this great organization, a woman who is a defender of women and children and who promotes the French language. She, I think that there are ways to modernize uh, the governance of this association. The Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker, I don't think citizens are comfortable with the explanations given by the minister. There's been scandalous spending, projects that go sideways, no transparency, incomplete explanations. I think Liberals have to stop laughing at Canadians, stop defending the indefendable, and ask for an accounting. When are we going to get public explanation? It's the least thing we can expect. The Honourable Minister, Mr. Speaker, as I already said, my team and I are dealing with the Administrator and the Secretary General in a way that will update and make more transparent the financial systems. You know that there are 84 member states, so accounting is done in a very systematic way with very rigorous processes, but we will follow up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Four. Mr. Speaker, the job of the Secretary General of La Francophonie is to bring its members together. Well, Michel Jean has certainly done that. Member countries have come together to speak out against her outrageous expenses. 
She spent $20,000 on a piano, a half million dollar renovation on her apartment, and $50,000 on a four day stay at the posh Waldorf Astoria in New York. How can the Liberals continue to support her candidacy as head of La Francophonie, now knowing her abuse of taxpayer dollars? The Minister of International Development. Mr. Speaker, once again, I think we should be proud of having a Canadian at the head of this great organization who defends women's rights, who promotes the French language. Once again, I will say that the administrators and the Secretary General are working at updating and modernizing the rules of transparency, and I would remind my colleagues that there are 84 member nations. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Launched in April, the IDEAS program was a commitment taken in Canada's defence policy, strong, secure, engaged. The program is designed to involve academics, industry and innovators from throughout Canada in solving the security and defence challenges of today and tomorrow. I know that both the Minister and his Parliamentary Secretary have been active in organising events and roundtables to highlight the program. Can the Minister of National Defence please give this House an update on the IDEAS program? Good question. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague from uh, Kingston and the Islands for his uh, hard work on the National Defence uh, uh, Committee. Uh, Mr. Speaker, today we are announcing the next phase of our IDEAS program. The IDEAS Innovation Network will support multidisciplinary networks that will help increase academic engagement and build Canadian expertise in defence and security challenges. This is another example of how the IDEAS program is delivering solutions that will support and protect the women and men of the Canadian Armed Forces. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Foothills. Mr. Speaker, the Green Backlog has been a devastating impact with more than $500 million in grain trapped on the prairies, costly demurrage fees being passed on to Canadian farmers. Right. And what we've seen is our farmers are in crisis, uh, our reputation as a global trading partner has been tarnished, and Liberals have done nothing except defend the rail lines. Farming groups are demanding that the Liberals have a plan to minimize the impact <laughs> the CP rail strike will have on Canadian farmers. What is the Liberals' plan to ensure that no further harm is done to our farming economy in case of a CP rail strike? Honourable Minister of Employment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member for the question. We, too, uh, are very concerned about making sure the farmers have access to the rail line that ensures that they can get their markets to their crops to market. I've met with both parties over the weekend. We continue to work with the parties to reach a solution. This government believes in uh, the collective bargaining process, and we stand beside the parties as they work towards a, a deal. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Laurier Saint Marie. Mr. Speaker, last week the government of Israel announced that it was going to build 2,500 housing units in the new illegal colonies in the West Bank, an occupied Palestinian territory. This week, Canada is signing a free trade agreement, an updated one with Israel, with a visit by the Israeli economy, uh, Minister of Economy. Can the minister tell the House if this government considers that these illegal colonies are part of Israeli territory in this updated accord? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Speaker, Canada is an unfailing ally of Israel. We are engaged towards a fair and just peace in this area. We want to see Israelis and Palestinians living side by side in peace and safety. We want there to be the conditions necessary in order that both parties can find a solution, and Canada is an active partner in the conversation. Vimy. Honourable Member for Vimy. Mr. Speaker, the Syrian co uh, conflict has left, led rather to the displacement of 5.5 million people, according to the High Commissioner for Refugees. We're proud that Canada has responded by welcoming more than 40,000 of these people. But Syria's neighboring countries have had a huge impact on the situation. Have improved this situation? Thank you. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for her interest, and also I'd like to thank the sponsoring families. 
we're helping uh, these these people in Lebanon through education prob um, through education programs. We're also developing women's co skills so that they can get involved in municipal uh, governance. We're trying to help them take part in local governance in order to increase stability. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Chinese telecommunications giant Huawei Technologies has, has established vast Canadian networks aimed at acquiring leading-edge 5G wireless technology. Huawei was previously implicated in stealing trade secrets and spying, in which, why, which is why Canadian and American intelligence and security officials continue to warn that there are significant cybersecurity risks uh, because of their connections with communist China. When will the Liberals launch a full review of Huawei's activities in Canada? The Honourable Minister of Economic Development. Mr. Speaker, we've clearly demonstrated that under the Investment Canada Act, we have the tools necessary to make sure that we address our national interest. With regards to any concerns around intellectual property, as the member full well knows, we just recently launched Canada's first national IP strategy. And the purpose of this strategy is to make sure that any of the intellectual property that's generated in Canada benefits Canadians. We are playing a leadership role when it comes to our national interests, and we're also making sure we provide the tools necessary for our academic institutions and businesses to succeed in Canada and protect their IP. Honorable Deputy de Rivière du Nord. Honorable Member for Rivière du Nord, Mr. Speaker, since the beginning of 2018, more than 7,000 asylum seekers, irregular asylum seekers, have entered Quebec. We thought the problem was the safe third country agreement, but now we know the real problem is the minister, Mr. Speaker. No triage, no changes to the agreement, endless proce processing periods. It seems the minister is asleep at the switch. Can the prime minister help to solve this crisis by finding a minister who can work a little more effectively? The Honourable Minister of Transport, Mr. Speaker, we're working diligently on this file, which is a very complex one, as you know. There's been a great deal of misinformation uh, directed at asyl asylum seekers, so we're trying to deal with this through our awareness raising program in Nigeria and in the United States. We think it's important to have very clear rules that will uh, say who can uh, seek asylum, and we are communicating the fact that these people have to go through an independent tribunal. The Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker, the Minister has been traveling so much or busy preparing his uh, tourist trip to Nigeria that he doesn't know that it's in Plattsburgh that asylum seekers find out that they don't have to respect our frontiers. Instead of playing tourist, can the Minister assure us that the Safe Third Country Agreement will apply over our entire border and make sure that this agreement is enforced everywhere. The Honourable Minister of Transport, Mr. Speaker, as I said, this is a very complex file and we're working not only with provinces such as Quebec and Ontario who are uh, receiving asylum seekers, but we're also working with our partners in the United States. The Safe Third Country Agreement was raised at the present time. There are no formal uh, discussions, but our American colleagues are aware of the situation. Okaki, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transport. The changes Transport Canada is proposing to flight crew work hours and rest periods threatens the very survival of small airlines that serve communities in my riding. For all these communities, air is the only link. Given the unique reliance of these communities on air service, a one-size-fits-all approach won't, won't work. Will the minister engage in further consultations as requested by the Co Coalition of Canadian Airlines and work with them to achieve a mutually acceptable solution that works for everyone? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his uh, question. Uh, as he points out, uh, transportation in the north is literally a lifeline to communities and is so important for their economic and social development. At the same time, as Minister of Transport, I have to ensure that uh, air transportation is done in a safe manner, and that includes uh, 
the issue of crew duty day and fatigue, uh, and we are doing this at the moment. I have been in contact with northern stakeholders and northern air operators, and we will continue to do so as we move forward. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Notice the ways and means of motion.